Well, this evening we may be grateful for the air-conditioned banyan tree, because uh, it would be rather warm somewhere in the Himalayas on a night like this. <clears throat> the writing of our book, self Fullman, occurred about the middle of the years of my public activity, about 20 years ago, which was the climax of the 20 preceding years in which our various lines of thought developed and integrated. During that period, leading up to the publication of this book, I had a very wide contact with practically every type of religious teaching in the United States, Europe, and Asia. During that time also, I knew most of the personalities we, with whom we now associate uh, various movements, some continuing, others have ceased to exist. And as a result of the peculiarly tense situation uh, that was involved, uh, probably in part due to the years of depression, which had been most fatiguing on the public psychology, and perhaps due to the exceeding gullibility and good-heartedness of most persons who had little previous contact with the higher brackets of philosophical thinking, there was an unusual amount of confusion, misdirection, misinformation. Perhaps that was one of the real reasons that led me to write the book. But in any event, most of the points which I have made in this essay are based upon personal observations and experiences and the result of trying to help people put together lives that had broken apart under the pressures of unwise religious thinking. Now most of the extremely pernicious habits of that time are not as prevalent with us today, but we have developed some more bad habits, and in a good many cases the new habits are merely restatements of the old ones, like man's development of the vices of one generation or another, which look very much like the vices of all generations when we begin to analyze them. It became obvious at the very beginning of, the, of my career that one of our big problems was the peculiar inconsistency of human nature in the so-called truth seeker. We simply do not look at ourselves. We are so busy hoping for the best or fearing the worst that we seldom make a factual study of our own natures. We do not really estimate to what degree we are responsible for the troubles that move in upon us. We are also often inclined to overlook what we consider to be small or unimportant personal peculiarities. We sort of feel that if we really make a good try, all our mistakes will be forgiven us. Unfortunately, however, the, one of our biggest mistakes is involved in the good try. Uh, our effort is not wise, not thoughtful, and not well considered. Now this peculiar limitation has survived these years and is just about as prevalent as it ever was. And much of it hides under unclear motivation. There's been a great deal of debate even among the most scholarly minds as to whether it is humanly possible for an individual to be unselfish and accomplish anything. Some take it for granted that practically every instinct that we have is in some way based upon self-interest that the person is incapable 
of completely separating his consciousness from his own peculiar needs and his own peculiar desires. I don't want to browbeat this point. It is not perhaps the most vital, but I do think that the most obvious, the most commonplace examples of self-interest must be considered as contributing to a great many misfortunes, not only in our religious life, but in our general affairs. Where self-interest is permitted to become too dominant, certainly we get into trouble. Now, as I suggested, this self-interest is often well concealed under some kind of a broad policy. And I've worked a good deal in the last few years with individuals who would have sworn on the Bible that they were unselfish. <coughs> Yet not at one moment in the entire contact that I had with them were they unselfish for an instant. They just did not know what selfishness meant when applied to their own conduct. Perhaps one way we can get at this is by means of a brief journey into Zen. Buddhism, recognizing the peculiar intensity of man's illusion as this related to his own conduct, attempted to cut the Gordian knot. It simply emphasized the importance of the individual completely renouncing the world and everything in it. Renouncing friends, family, renouncing home, wealth, uh, ambition, career, and taking the ground that either we served the universal to the exclusion of everything else, or we served the personal to the exclusion of the universal. In Ceylon, the monks of the Hinayana school still very largely follow this old idea that the individual, in order to free his consciousness, had to simply give up every involvement by which consciousness could be conditioned. That it was impossible for the individual to escape the tendency to exaggerate, misinterpret, misunderstand, or allow ulterior motives to enter into his conduct so long as he was in the world. Now, of course, Buddhism went even further than this. It realized that the person could take his worldliness out of the world and nurse it even in the wilderness. And to cope with this peculiar problem of the worldliness in man. Nearly every religion has set up some kind of asceticism uh, to represent a major sacrifice of worldly attitude in the effort to attain a spiritual state. Now this rather extreme measure has been attempted in the West. It has been attempted by oriental teachers who came over here some of them good and some of them bad, but sincere in their effort uh, to create an asceticism among Western people. I've watched this for years, and the results have always been bad. The actual fact seems to be that the average Westerner is not an ascetic. His attitudes have been conditioned too long. There is too deep a rooting in what we term the Western way of life, which is a way of personal involvement in every instant of physical living. Yet there should be and has to be some way in which Western man, uh, without being expected to accomplish the impossible, or have his equilibrium or even his sanity endangered, by an asceticism which he cannot understand properly, there still must be some way for this person to grow, to build and develop a type of character that is suitable uh, to his personal unfoldment and to the laws of living under which he exists. 
I think the Neoplatonists uh, worked with this problem perhaps more successfully than any other Western group. They pointed out uh, that a rugged isolation was not necessary, that actually growth was a use of the commonplace, that the individual could always use the conditions under which he lived and the situations in which he found himself as the basis for a proper and continuing unfoldment of his own nature. This, however, was not interesting in the times of Neoplatonism because it was not glamorous enough. Most individuals felt the need of a highly glamorized or highly dramatized spiritual code. It did not appear to them to be successful or satisfactory merely to learn to live better. They wanted some promise of mystery and magic. They wanted to believe that through some specific exercises they could either travel around the invisible universe or see things which average persons could not see and sometimes they succeeded in seeing things that nobody ever saw. It was uh, a rather mixed blessing and I have known a great many of these characters who, were, who claimed to be out of their bodies part of the time and were obviously out of their heads the rest of the time. <laughs> Yet they did not realize this, they were perfectly sincere in their belief that their own strange, wild way would accomplish the ends which they desired. I watched them through all these years of fantasy. I know they did not accomplish the end that they desired. But like most failures of this kind, they went down to the silence of the grave and no one ever really knew whether they succeeded or failed. But I watched them and I know that they failed. They undoubtedly gained certain rewards in terms of universal recognition of a good try, but they did not attain the ends which they sought. They simply did not have the basic values by which human beings develop under a pattern or in a situation. Therefore, it was, I, uh, it was, as I mentioned last week, my desire to prepare some kind of a study that was suitable for Western man. And in doing this, it became obvious that Western man had certain faculties which were useful, that he had his own problems which he also had to master, and that his way of growth was the integration of his own Western way and that this integration could be helped by an increased understanding of the spiritual foundations of all peoples who we have all in every generation and in every area been confronted by somewhat similar problems of stress. Therefore, what are the problems that beset every human being in the common sense of the weaknesses of his nature, the inadequacies of his knowledge, the lack of organization of his attitudes by which his life is daily plagued. And the correction of such errors or mistakes certainly constitutes a proper beginning for the development of a better life. All great systems have pointed out that so-called spiritual advancement is not supernormal. It is not something by which the individual is sort of set apart as a different kind of creature. So the spiritual growth is simply the development of the natural resources of the individual. It is perfectly normal for the individual to grow and we can only try to understand why this normal procedure does not operate as it should. 
A man does not grow because someone waves a magic wand over him, nor does he develop his spirituality in the face of others because he was predestined and foreordained. A growth in this world is the problem of gradually increasing control of the various elements which go to make up living. And we may say that the adjusted person is the one who has learned how to grow. And if his growth continues in an orderly and, ma and proper manner, he will ultimately attain the interior enlargement which he seeks. Thus, all growth must be by natural means, not by some strange supernaturalism. Growth is not a strange doctrine. It is the individual gradually putting himself in order, and he must do this on purpose. Now it does appear, and it is true, that some persons are born due to the development of their own nature and previous embodiments or by the laws of karma operating in life with what appears to be a better foundation than others. They seem to have better faculties, uh, perhaps a little less difficulty in bringing their lives into order. But this again is something which I think can be analyzed rather critically. Actually, a person who has better facilities or better personal integration nearly always is confronted with a larger problem. In other words, uh, as we grow, the challenge grows with us. And it is not really fair to say that it is any easier uh, for the better equipped person to win this fight than a person with fewer endowments. Because the victory is different in each case. Growth for each person is his own next step, not somebody else's next step. Furthermore, this next step has never been standardized. There is no way of saying getting up in front of a large group of persons or even a small group and saying this is the next step for all of you. The next step for each individual is the correction of the most glaring fault of the moment, whatever that may be. And this correction is actually best known to the person himself. And unless he has blocked his mentality, with some type of auto-hypnosis, he is able to guess pretty clearly what this next step for himself is most likely to be. But having discovered, perhaps, what the next step is, he may simply rest in bewilderment. We all know some things we should do better. We wonder why we don't. We try and in a short time the effort becomes too great for us. We really sincerely make some kind of an endeavor, but uh, we discover that our machinery for the control of ourselves is inadequate. We believe certain things, we want to do them, but we simply do not have the power with which to do them. And our Western way of life, because of its comparative lack of emphasis upon the development of the internal resources of the person, does not give us very much help. We graduate from school fairly well informed in mental processes, but we also graduate almost completely the servant or slave of these mental processes. Uh, we learn how to make a living, we learn how to barter and exchange, we learn simple rules through the application of which we fit into the peculiar period in which we live, but we do not generally possess any skill permitting us to make a change in ourselves. 
all through the years, and it's pretty close to his 40 years this year, this has been the point that I have observed most consistently, that the person does not know how to change himself. He knows how to discuss the change. He knows perhaps formulas that might work. He knows what he would like to be instead of what he is. But he remains to the bitter end what he is. And the good resolutions are like a certain plans for retirement, usually pushed ahead so far that the grave catches us first. The only answer to this process of changing self lies in what the ancients called disciplines. We know that we can, under certain inducements, achieve a certain kind of change. We know that the person learning to play the piano can gradually increase in skill until, if he has some basic aptitude and a great deal of industry, he may become a proficient musician. He can train his hands. The artist can train his eye. The artist has to learn to discipline sight. The musicologist has to learn to discipline the receptivity of his own ears. The performing musician has to learn to discipline those parts of his personality which are involved in the presentation of his vocal or instrumental music. Individuals can achieve this discipline. Usually, however, if they achieve it at all, they achieve it only because of some one pressing resolution within themselves. This may be the instinct to be superior. It may be the desire to earn more money. It may be the instinct uh, for applause or fame. But this type of physical discipline is accomplished by practice, by dedication, and by continuity of effort. The individual who disciplines his physical faculties feels that he has achieved a great deal, and in large he has. But when it comes to attempting to discipline his emotions or his mental characteristics, he finds himself still at a greater loss. To the average person, discipline, if it exists at all, is a genteel form of browbeating. The individual feels that his faults must simply be killed out, wiped out, that he must nag himself into a state of grace. He doesn't succeed. He nags himself into a neurosis. He tries to impose discipline upon himself uh, by brute force alone, and this is quite common in religion, where an individual taking some obligation of a religious nature feels that it is his moral duty to abide by this resolution. If his courage and sincerity are sufficient, he will stick to his resolution, but it may cost him his life. He is still not understanding the basic idea of discipline. Discipline is not whipping yourself. Discipline is not gritting your teeth and going on with something uh, which is not according to your real desires, but is done from the sense of duty, responsibility, or obligation. So in the West, we have very little honorable and proper self-discipline. Children are not taught discipline even as much now as they were 25 years ago. And the general tendency today is that the individual believes that his right to liberty implies that he will not be self-disciplined, that discipline is a form of slavery, that the disciplined person is simply one who is inhibited, frustrated, or restrained from doing those things which he most desires to do. As long as this attitude remains, we have no progress in philosophy. We have no hope or expectation 
of anything except this peculiar type of legality under which we live, in which we are a little afraid to break the law because of punishment, but have no honorable and sincere respect for the law in itself. Discipline uh, always suggests, therefore, some type of insight. The individual cannot become uh, capable of various advanced disciplines without an adequate background in the principles of religious philosophy. He cannot step from the life of the sinner into the hoped career of the saint uh, simply by conversion. He must have some understanding with which to operate. Censorship of his own action is not only a matter of strength, it is a matter of discretion. The person must wisely administer the various types of discipline which he imposes upon himself. For if it's all enthusiasm, he will certainly get into trouble. An enthusiasm of this nature burns out and after a period of comparatively unrewarded effort, the individual drops back into his own ways and his old ways because he sees no longer any inducement to be uncomfortable. Discipline thus means that the person must be able to evaluate not only his own conduct, but the conduct of others. He must sense the direction in which his own effort should go, and he must strive very devoutly to keep balance at all times, and never permit himself to indulge in any excess of mental or emotional pressure. Uh, we have, for instance, a very common situation in which the person attempting to attain some type of spiritual improvement uh, becomes creed-bound, becomes set in some kind of a pattern. By degrees, the boundaries of this pattern become a slavery uh, that uh, can cause a great deal of harm. Uh, devotion to principles is wonderful but devotion to things not understood in themselves can lead to trouble. And today, many thousands of well-meaning persons who are seeking to grow for the glory of God have, because of the restrictions which they have placed upon uh, creedal and sectarian considerations, have placed themselves in a condition where it is impossible for them uh, to really experience the universality of anything. In other words, one moment the individual says, I want to grow, I want to be better, but obviously the thing I belong to is right and what everybody else belongs to is wrong. Or, very temperately and very nobly, what I believe is more right than anybody else's and if these other people are right at all, it's just sort of, well, they're doing the best they can. We, uh, in other words, sort of damn them with, fall, with faint praise. We, we become intolerant even while we are practicing tolerance. We become creed-bound and sect-bound even while we are proclaiming the unity of life and we become critical and condemnatory of others while we are doubt, devoutly addicted to the brotherhood of man. These things the person himself seldom sees, but others see it in him, and it's one of the reasons why he doesn't make more converts when he starts out trying to spread, spread the glad tidings that he has received. So discipline is a very skillful problem. And under our present pressures, it is a little more important than ever before that we analyze the various procedures, realizing that we must build the new upon what we have and not upon what we have not. That we have certain energies which we have developed, 
certain policies and practices that are familiar to us. These must contribute the basic material for our improvement. And uh, this is good in itself because it prevents us from making this unfortunate dichotomy in which we declare if one thing is right, everything else has to be wrong. Uh, to, uh, to get out of that emergency, a little Zen is very helpful. So in the, this book, I have tried to point out these basic issues on the ground that we must begin to grow where we are with the facilities and faculties that we now possess. We must use the instruments which our time and our race has given us. And we must grow in a manner that does not endanger us or cause us to become fanatical, or perhaps more seriously than this, victims of some type of abnormal psychical aberration. The great danger in all these exercises and processes as handed down to us from the past has been the danger of aberration. Uh, one of the great French transcendentalists, Eliphas Levy, said many years ago that the garden of Maya, or illusion, is filled with beautiful flowers, and around the stem of each flower is twined a poisonous serpent. It's a very interesting uh, symbolism. And delusion is the penalty of ulterior motive. Delusion is one of the inevitable byproducts of the individual who is trying to develop the superphysical use of sensory perceptions without having disciplined the ordinary use of them. The moment we move from the comparatively small area of the known into the vast and inconceivable area of the unknown, we fall into the most dangerous of all conditions, and that is the state of mystery. Not one person in 10,000 can live successfully in a mystery. This mystery, this darkness which seems to surround us, becomes a kind of reflector and calls out of our own natures and reflects back upon ourselves every abnormalcy that is within us. Thus, as in ancient times it is said we people the universe with demons, and looking into the sky looked as though into a mirror and frightened ourselves out of our wits by our own grimaces. The small child does this. The hole in the dark, the punishment of the dark closet, can work a great hardship upon a sensitive child today. But man trying to move out of the known into the unknown is stepping into the darkest closet of all. And he cannot make this step safely until he is master of himself. Up to that time, this step into the unknown is a step into chaos. And even further than this, it is not that the individual lands in a darkness which he cannot penetrate. He lands, rather, in a state of delusion in which he is constantly obsessed by things which are not so. And it is more tragic to believe that which is not so than to believe very little. So out of all unbalanced, unwisely attempted self-development, all efforts to grow spiritually without building an adequate foundation under growth. All such procedures lead to self-delusion. And this self-delusion is not always unpleasant in its beginnings. Usually self-delusion begins to reveal some of the basic aberrations with which psychology is now concerned. And many individuals are being saved from this self-delusion process, which afflicted so many fifty years ago, 
by the fact that man is beginning to estimate the nature of his own delusional powers and begins to realize how he can fool himself, which he did not know nearly so well 40 or 50 years ago. But actually, all of this delusional material breaks down into the more familiar psychotic situations, the messianic complex, the divinity complex, and uh, similar things. And uh, I have gone along watching and studying and working with many, many lives uh, the, with these people uh, whose lives I have watched, who have gone through these delusional processes, usually beginning with something apparently lovely, beautiful, wonderful, messages that make things so sweet and fine and grand and noble. And then little by little, you could see the sickness creeping in. And this sickness ended in terror, in fear, in obsession, in a gradual increasing doubt about everything. A terrible mental and emotional sickness in which each new terror of the individual was reflected back to him again from the surface of this blazing mirror of illusion into which he was gazing. And in the end, what might have been a useful life lost the name of action. This type of delusion, again, you cannot work with. Once an individual has had a vision, regardless of whether it's any good or not, nothing you can say to him is as important to him as the thing he believes he has seen. No matter how you try to work with him or teach him, he will never be able to give the same strength to your remark as he gives to this disembodied voice that he seems to hear. So by degrees these vicious experiences take over, destroy judgment, destroy everything, and end in tragedy. The only protection against this type of condition is that man normally is preserved by nature from this type of situation. It is only when he breaks through the guards unwisely that he destroys the protection which nature naturally bestows. But once he becomes disoriented, once he loses anchorage with facts, once he is no longer able to estimate a fact from a falsehood, then he floats away into a terrible dereliction, a situation which too often cannot be cured in this life. So to meet all of this type of situation, we have tried to work out a practical program uh, to point up how the person can gradually get himself into a situation of consciousness in which he can make certain basic moves safely. Because the delusion always arises from this internal dishonesty. Now this dishonesty may not be intentional, it may be ignorance, but it is still wrong. And the small child who drops the match into the keg of gunpowder does not prevent the explosion merely because it's a small child. If we break these rules, we are in trouble. The only way that nature knows to keep us in line is to see that we cannot break law with impunity. So we have to watch these laws and live them to the very best of our ability. Now in the uh, work of this evening, I've put some markers here and there in the book to bring out some points which I'd like to make uh, some special um, uh, additional commentaries upon. And part of the material I've already made into a general commentary which I've just given you. In the, third, uh, in the fourth chapter of the book, under the general heading of placidity, we begin to take up a series of attitudes that are valuable to us. Let us imagine for a moment that you are on uh, a boat that 
is on fire or are in an automobile which has gotten which has gotten out of control or in any desperate situation you then realize as perhaps never before that your only hope of survival is a tremendous orientation you have you you must keep control of yourself you have to use every faculty as acutely as possible to extricate yourself from this emergency if you panic you are lost now this uh, is the same in connection with the personal growth of the individual uh, security and progress depend upon not ever panicking and uh, the panic may be a pleasant one or an unpleasant one uh, the individual who becomes over enthusiastic is guilty of the same situation as the one who becomes over fearful always uh, common sense rationality clear sightedness insight these all function best if the individual keeps control of himself so uh, the beginning of our search into this more abstract sphere as we begin in chapter 4 is to emphasize the importance of the development of placidity in the temperament. Uh, if you have a certain placidity, if you are able more or less to accept, if you are able to observe and consider and reflect with a degree of separateness so that it may be said that you can take a separate look at things this essentially means that you can partake in many forms of knowledge without being obsessed or possessed by them that you can take part in a discussion without being insulted or trying to insult someone else that you listen to learn and not to criticize that you are perfectly able to sit quietly a whole evening and let somebody else do the talking instead of believing that it is your moral duty to interrupt placidity is this power to gently accept um, a situation without becoming emotionally or mentally involved and at the same time alert to all the facts involved this means that whenever a judgment is demanded that you can come to this judgment without prejudice without pressure that you will not speak hastily or thoughtlessly nor will you try to dash in with a last-minute solution to a very basic and long-range problem now placidity does not mean that you never under any condition become excited but it is true that uh, for practical purposes excitement or emotional stress and emotional outbursts are escapes that are useful only to the individual who has no better way of using the energy certainly if you have a certain type of temperament and nothing else to do with it you may get considerable relief from an occasional outburst of hysteria it uh, psychologically is regarded as a kind of therapy it lets off steam but the real purpose of the steam is not to be let off that way the real purpose of the steam is to drive the engine and the individual who is not using his energies adequately and properly is the one who must have some kind of emotional outburst to balance his own failure uh, to organize his resources so poise does not mean not to do anything but it means never to do anything by emergency or desperation many people live a lifetime of perpetual emergency every issue every situation that arises has to be met with a full armament of emotional pressure these people will never get very far in the development of disciplines because they are using too much obvious energy 
They are not suited for the subtle application of principles. They just burst through things. They're like floods breaking through dams. They are not channeled energies. Placidity is a tremendous asset because it prevents us from these excesses. But placidity is not something you can simply say, on Monday I will sit quiet and twiddle my thumbs. You can't do this either. Placidity is not something that you can directly say, this I will be. Placidity arises from insight. Therefore, practically every degree of physical or mental or emotional control that you can exercise arises from your insight about fact or truth within yourself. Placidity, then, must arise from a disciplined philosophy of life. You must be placid for a reason, and you know exactly why. Your placidity must arise from the fact that you have outgrown hysteria, not that you have outlawed it. But all things being taken as equal in this problem of growth, the quiet, organized person accomplishes more, suffers less, wastes less than the person who has not this degree of self-control. Also, the placid person, because he does not have strong delusion that he is attempting to force upon himself is not so likely to deceive himself in the various pursuits uh, of growth. The individual who wants too much too soon will always deceive himself. And in philosophy as in morality, blessed is the individual who desireth little because it is not necessarily true that he will receive little, but because his desire level is not high, because he is relaxed and comparatively placid, nature finds him the most plastic instrument for the achievement of her own purposes. And the conflict between self-purpose and universal purpose is less where the individual is quiet and accepting by nature. Someone will say, well, I'm just not that kind of a nature. That's all there is to it. And, uh, when I don't like something, I want to hit somebody. Well, we can say this, and we can keep on doing it. These are choices that the individual has the right to make. That is part of this inalienable right uh, stuff we read about. But if we make use of it in that way, we also have the inalienable necessity of abiding by the consequences. The individual who says that he is going to do it his way, regardless, must then, in good grace, accept the consequences. But this he seldom likes to do. He is the first to feel himself abused. He is the first to lose confidence in the universe. Not because he has ever given it a chance, but because it has failed to do or be what he expects it to accomplish. It's his own mistake. So this placidity involves poise. And poise is this ability to meet all shock and stress with a maximum of attentiveness and a minimum of wasted energy. If we could put the energy that is wasted by the average person to work in his life, he would live an additional 50 years in good health. We sometimes see small children who cannot be kept quiet, and we see that they are bubbling over and going all the time. And later in life we look back and say, oh, if we only had their energy, if we only had the energy to use now, that we wasted when we were six, how happy we would be. But our problem is not that we wasted all this energy at six. We are wasting it all the time. 
We like to believe that man had more energy as a young person than he does as an older person. I think this is largely an error. I do not believe that it is a real loss of energy unless there is actual sickness. I think the matter of fact is that the older person breaks up his energy resources into too many patterns. He has a hundred things to accomplish to the child's one. He has innumerable purposes. He has fears and responsibilities and obligations that the child does not share. Therefore, he is wasting more energy than the child. The child is only running all the time and shouting, which is really the least waste of energy. A good hard soak, a good half hour's temper fit, will waste more energy in an adult than 24 hours of running, yelling, and screaming will waste in a child. Because the more mental and emotional stress goes with the use of energy, the greater fatigue. So our lack of poise, our lack of order, and our lack of self-discipline simply results in the perpetual exhaustion of our energy resources. The Chinese learned that, and so did the old Koreans. And the legends of these old gentlemen in the Diamond Mountains of Korea who lived quietly to the age of 160, and then like the wonderful one horse shave, fall apart of no particular ailment. These persons simply are individuals who have allowed their natures to run their full course, have gotten from the body all that it can give of support. It must ultimately be fatigued. But because of integration within themselves, have probably doubled the life expectancy of the undisciplined person. But the undisciplined person will say, if I had to live like those old gentlemen, I'd rather be dead. That is his answer. If he cannot have these wild moods, if he cannot do as he pleases, then there is no sense in being alive. And on this psychology, he rapidly joins his ancestors in forest lawn. <laughs> but it is quite possible that these old gentlemen are really enjoying life more than he does, depending on what kind of activity makes you happy. If happiness is the result of adjustment with life, kindly relations with others, love of beauty and scholarship, and a gradual increasing sense of intimate association with the great mysteries of life around us, if these things make us happy, the old Korean scholars are a very happy lot. If, however, only congestion, stress, and strain, and the fulfillment of our personal private ambitions, if this, all of these things alone make us happy, then we must pay the penalty because nature is not interested in our success on an economic level or on an industrial level. Nature is interested in only one thing, our success as human beings. And nature rewards us for that kind of success with the best rewards that she has. And these are health and happiness and contentment and freedom uh, from the stress and strain of fear and doubt and worry. Now another problem that lies very close to our American way of life is inconsistency. How rare it is to find a person whose words and actions are consistent, whose policies are consistent from day to day. Now consistency has become a bad word through misuse. By consistency we do not mean a dogged continued devotion to our own mistakes or the kind of consistency that arises out of the philosophy, if it was good enough for Father, it is good enough for me. This is not consistency, this is just narrow-mindedness. But consistency means the flowing of our own life without the jagged breaks which arise from total chemical disunity. A pattern in living once set up 
becomes not only physical but psychological. A person who takes certain attitudes, develops them, and creates patterns in his psyche, and then suddenly for some reason violates all these patterns, goes in a contrary direction, breaks down the whole structure that he has built up, puts himself at a terrible disadvantage. Inconsistency divides resources, reduces strength of purpose, and causes the person finally to fall between two chairs. He cannot uh, unite his energies for any definite purpose. Consistency is logic in a certain reason, way of thinking. Logic is order. Consistency, therefore, is orderliness. It is the gradual reduction of life to its simplest, most practical, reasonable plan. It is escape from fashion, from fad. It is escape from the extravagances of conformity with foolishness. It is the individual quietly determining a course of reasonable policy, suitable to his means, suitable to his needs, and most inclined to free his life of unnecessary worries and responsibilities, and the acceptance of this pattern and the living of it. So in a sense, this becomes the simple life. Now, a simple life is not necessarily the life of Thoreau by the banks of Walden. The simple life is not a hut in the desert. The simple life is the individual living simply where he is. There is no great advantage in this idea that the simple life has to be an impoverished one. It is not what we have or do not have that determines these qualities. It is the use we make of what we have and the attitude we have toward it. And the person with a wrong attitude can get as, into as much trouble clinging to a nickel as another man can get into trouble with a wrong attitude in his effort to cling to ten million dollars. It is not the amount, it is the basic attitude. And simplicity simply means the direct living of life, clearing it of all unnecessary involvement and freeing the mind and heart continuously for essentials, and essentials in this situation being the rudiments and elements of immediate personal growth. I have known probably a hundred persons who have come to me and told me that they wish they had time for study, but they had this to take care of. They had that to take care of. One individual told me that they would like to take on the simple life. They'd love to have this kind of a gentle way of existence. They would certainly admire peace and, and quietude and freedom. They'd always wanted to be scholars, but they couldn't do anything about it because they had to spend 10 hours a day at the stock exchange. And how they could go on for most of a fairly long life kidding themselves into saying that their real interest was growth and then be patiently willing to spend hour upon hour watching stocks go up and down. It wasn't because anyone was depending on them. It wasn't because of any need. It was simply that this inconsistency never, see, never meant anything. The individual never saw that far into the stone wall which was himself. And this situation, in one way or another, burdens many people. Another point we've made here was patience. Now, patience is a virtue which is much debated these times. Many folks say patience is no good at all. What we need is dynamic impatience. But if we must have any impatience at all, I think we should turn it to ourselves and be impatient with ourselves for the stupid things we do. But broadly speaking, patience again is a letdown. It's this quietening down of the nature. The patient person is free from this tremendous 
impulse to force things. And this effort to force things is especially bad in religion. And the impatient people who are trying to force cosmic consciousness on themselves are not as few as we wish they were. The impatience to be like God, or the impatience to be with God, although I have not observed too many people impatient to get there by way of death. They are always talking about death being the return to God, but no one seems to be in an awful hurry to get there. But cosmic consciousness, yes. All these great things, individuals, I know hundreds of them, that joined a movement or an organization, were there for eight weeks, did not become illumined, then immediately moved out and joined another one. Just, we've got to get there in a big hurry. Of course, they never got anywhere. An, imp an impatience in everything in life uh, breaks all probabilities of progress. So you see a whole series of related attitudes, poise, peacefulness of internal life, patience. All these related attitudes have as their purpose to quiet us down, realizing that the growth of the person comes when the false motions are relaxed. It is only when false motion ceases that true motion can be noted or be apperceived within the person himself. Until then, he is a victim of his own impatiences. The outer mind is forever in conflict with what might be termed the intuitive apperception. In psychology, we suspect that this is the reason why so many of the essential archetypal symbols come to man only in sleep. Sleep is the most patient moment in the average person's existence. It's the only time when he is not trying to press his own purposes on something or someone. And in this state of quietude, the internal archetypal patterns move through him. The moment he wakes in the morning and starts to be filled with his own purposes again, these dream experiences have a tendency to retire and may even be completely forgotten. But here is an important lesson, that in the relaxation and quietude of sleep, the individual receives something from within himself, whereas the rest of the time he is forcing something upon himself from the outside continuously. As long as this forcing continues, as long as he is under pressure, he is like a politician who is under the domination of some other politician. He is no longer able to act his own part, to be himself, and uh, must become merely a parrot for something that is not himself. So all these things point to the beginnings of an orderly approach to life. Now most of chapter 5 is concerned with concentration, and that is the natural outcome of the points that we have been already uh, discussing. Concentration is actually the individual attempting to coordinate his own resources. Assuming, as we know, that the average person has a considerable number of related uh, uh, mental and emotional patterns with which he works, he has a degree of versatility, and he is able to conjure up with his own mental activities innumerable ideas, beliefs, and opinions, or to envision innumerable objectives for himself or for others. The tendency of the mind, therefore, is to become addicted to the immediate pressures of the moment to throw energy in the direction of immediate interest. And whatever problem is at that moment most fascinating gets the attention. And then the next day a different pattern takes over and that gets the attention. And by degrees we sort of inch our way in a semi-backward motion through life like the proverbial crab, uh, dedicating our energy 
to the interest of each separate moment without any definite effort to relate these things or to pattern them or to put a purpose or a continuity into this mental activity. As a result, we may become jacks of all trades, which at a business level is not good because it means that we have a number of half-developed abilities. In the mental and emotional life, we have an innumerable number of unfinished ideas, some of which perish in the void, others return again to the subconscious, and others still linger along but without sufficient libido to ever develop anything. Against this type of person, we have the so-called one-track individual, who is usually a complete success and a terrible bore. The one-track individual who has narrowed himself in his interests in order to attain depth. So your individual who gets depth is narrow, and the individual who gets breadth is shallow. And this combination is everywhere obvious. The purpose of concentration is that the person who is beginning to appreciate value begins to know what he really wants to do or to be, and who is particularly interested in the integration of his own life into a constructive pattern, realizing that this interior integration is going to move into manifestation and make him a better adjusted person in this world also. This problem of concentration is the gathering up of energies, otherwise to be wasted or lost, to achieve penetration, like the focusing of light through a magnifying lens, by means of which the rays of the sun are brought to a point which gives them burning power. This concentration of uh, faculties and powers means that in some direction we begin to make essential progress. We know that this concentration is necessary to general achievement, but we do not realize that it is necessary to the particular integration of ourselves. The person who cannot concentrate at will is denied the strength of his own resources to the achievement of the ends which he desires. Most individuals who do try to concentrate achieve it through a sort of automatic addiction. A man like Edison could probably hardly ever get his mind off of his inventions and his formulas. He had become completely identified with a project that took all of his energy and all of his time. He concentrated automatically. But to the other and to the average person, concentration is something that has to be developed. We have to gradually uh, gain control of ourselves. For he who controlleth himself is greater than he who taketh a city. And this old statement is just as true today as it ever was. So the Indians and the Chinese and all these ancient peoples had their philosophic symbolism about the concentrational processes. And in the self-unfoldment book, we take up several of these uh, procedures. Always remembering that physical symbolism must in every instance be interpreted into its, you might say, universal meaning. Uh, for example, uh, we speak in here, in one section, the description of the old Buddhist Ahat, who preparing himself for the meditative life or for the meditative experience, first seated himself and then gathered his robes about him. Now this sounds like a very nice bit uh, of thespionics, but it is really an entirely different situation. Uh, when the Eastern monk or the Eastern philosopher or the Zen mystic is told to seat himself in the law, it does not mean that he's going to bring up a chair or find a rock and squat on it. 
To seat oneself means to establish oneself. It means to place oneself on a firm foundation. And in the Buddhist symbolism, the old uh, arhats or the bodhisattvas are most frequently represented as seated in the open blossom of a lotus. Certainly no lotus was ever that size, but that has nothing to do with the symbolism. It is much better that way. The lotus is the symbol of the unfoldment of the universal mystery. Therefore, to seat oneself in the lotus is simply to establish oneself in nature, uh, to remove all conflicts or all inconsistencies uh, which make the earth beneath us an uncertain ground. To seat oneself means to resolve. Uh, we are told that in the illumination of Buddha, in the deer park at Sarna, now at the Bodhi tree at Bodha Gaya, later he spoke at Sarna, but the original revelation was at Bodha Gaya. It is said that he finally seated himself under the bow tree, and he made an obligation or an oath in which he stated that he would not move from that place until either death released him or illumination came. He would not stand up again. He would remain there, seated under that tree, until he'd, either he died or the truth was made known to him. Now, the Bodhi tree, of course, is largely a symbolic device also, although that perhaps was some lordly banyan there at that time. But to be seated means to be firm, to no longer wander about, and to wander about may mean to move from one creed to another, or from one notion to another, or from one addiction to another. But to be, sit down and say, where I am, here I will receive the enlightenment. That there will be no more scattering of resources, no more hunting and searching and seeking, but the realization that all that we know and all that we need to know must come from within ourselves. That we, are, we do not gain anything by traipsing up and down the world, and we do not gain anything by changing or shifting the polarities of our own thinking every few minutes. To seek oneself in the law is simply to accept the law to declare that it is our way and our guide, that it is our very present help in time of trouble, that everything we are, we owe to the law. Everything we need, we must derive from the law. Therefore, we take our position firmly upon the great pattern of the law, and particularly upon the two great laws which Buddha taught, reincarnation and karma. But we we'll suddenly rest our case upon the infinite plan of things and say here I accept and here I remain and here I shall practice the disciplines and I shall either achieve the end or I shall perish. This final decision gathers up all of these loose ends and causes them to become reconciled in one purpose uh, that there shall be no more inconstancy or inconsistency in our moves or our methods or our means then the old Ahat is said to gather his robes about him his vestments now the robes and vestments are variously understood in the order of Adanta or Tantra to represent the energy fields which surround the body. But they may also represent our other garments, the garments with which we adorn our intellectual and emotional lives. For our garments are also not only our bodies and our energies, but our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs, our hopes, our fears. For all these, to a measure, clothe us with the vestments with which we appear before the world as we present the mask of the persona to those before us. So our temperament, 
our disposition robes our inner life. So we gather our garments around us, can very well and did mean in Tibet and those countries, uh, the reduction of waste of energy, the gradual drawing together of all of our abilities, all our energies, all our hopes, sitting quietly, established in the law, and conserving every resource and power which we possess. And then in very definite quiet to consider what we might term the concentrational procedure. Now what is the actual virtue of concentration? This has been a question uh, that has a great deal of merit in it for consideration. Concentration is essentially the control of action and even of conscious thought by a policy, pattern, or conviction of the will. Concentration, theoretically, can be achieved by anyone who has the tremendous degree of self-control necessary to accomplish it. If, however, we so interpret it, then concentration may or may not have any spiritual significance. Because concentration, which is merely an exercise of will, is not the end by which the Zen monk, for example, hopes to attain to the Parnava. Concentration is itself a symbol, but it is a symbolic process rather than a symbolic attitude. It is a gradual means by which the person demonstrates or proves, if he practices it correctly, the proper method of imposing principle over personal conduct. Concentration, then, is one way of telling ourselves and proving to ourselves that we are no longer the slave of our own appetites and instincts, that we have suddenly realized the true relationship of consciousness and body, that body is the faithful servant of consciousness, and as this faithful servant is one of the most valuable and important of all instruments. But if this relationship is destroyed, or if there is a serious mistake in our procedure, and body becomes master, then man's consciousness is ruled by a beast. The body becomes not the good ruler, but the tyrant, the dictator, the despot, the autocrat controlling our soul by the autocracy of appetites. The body will not even be able to preserve itself in this way, because it lacks the unit of consciousness by means which man is able to direct body, but body is not able to protect itself. Therefore, when the body rules the person in it, we then have the individual ruled by the worst part of himself. Not because the body is essentially bad. This is not the case. But the body is essentially merely a self-preserving organism, perfectly contented to preserve itself at the expense of the energy which sustains it. It is irrational in that respect. But as the instrument of man, the body becomes a wonderful and useful media for the transmission and communication of knowledge, ideas, understanding, and experience. So our problem in concentration is to demonstrate more than anything else the fact that we can concentrate. The victory is not in the thing we concentrate upon but the fact that we attain the power to turn our attention naturally, easily, and without pressure or force according to our own purpose. That we say, I am going to think about this for ten minutes. That we think about it for ten minutes without even a feeling of distraction or a desire to think about something else simply because we have decided that for ten minutes we are going to use the mind in that way. 
To start such disciplines at 40 or 50 years of age is very much like trying to, co to correct a delinquent child in its late 20s. It is not easy. But it is still a problem that has to be done if the person ever expects to penetrate the veil of illusion that divides him from a world of principles and causes. So in our particular problem, the real end of concentration is not this browbeating, not this sitting with your eyes closed, your teeth clenched, and both hands desperately grabbing the chair arms, trying to think of God when everything else is coming along. This is not concentration. And nor is it concentration to sit all day in some beautiful blue haze of memories, thoughts, and recollections or dreaming about the wonderful time when we were initiated in the temples of Egypt in some summer land of our own imagination. This is not concentration. Nor is concentration the process of sitting with your eyes densely and tightly closed, demanding infinite supply. It is not the individual or sitting with a rigid determination that he is going to influence his friends, his neighbors, and his enemies. Uh, these are not concentration, because concentration aimed at the uh, at some material end, some accomplishment, which is going to aid us in the perpetuation of our pet illusions, has a, has no value as a concentrated discipline. The end is that we learn to graciously lead the personality that we can detach ourselves from servitude to the body without hurting the body, without picking on it, without declaring that it is unworthy of us or that it is only an old carcass of some kind. This is not the purpose, nor that we should lock in a bitter battle between the ways of the spirit and the ways of the flesh. All of these things are wrong, and I've seen people go into the most terrible difficulties trying to nurse these attitudes. Because every discipline in nature, every philosophy that has dealt with the problems of life is gracious. Nature, in for conscious beings like the human being, possessing interior faculties, does not simply lambast these creatures. It works with them and through them, ever persuasively. And our her punishments are only for those who obstinately refuse to see. They are generally given the seven and seventy different opportunities before punishment is really meted out. So our purpose in this whole concentration problem is gracious one-pointedness. Not that we tyrannize, but that we simply realize that we have a right to use these faculties and to determine how they are to be used. And that through our general studies and disciplines and thoughtfulness, through our philosophy and our religion, and through the counsel of the great teachers from whom our essential knowledge is derived, that we know approximately how these faculties should be used. And we are going to try to bring ours into line with this picture. So that when we say to the mind, think, it will think. And when we say to the mind, rest, it will rest. And when we say to ourselves, this is no cause of worry, we will not keep on worrying. Also that the instinct to worry or to fear will gradually cease because of basic thoughtfulness and understanding. But by concentration, as an exercise, we do achieve gradually this sense of orientation, this sense of leadership in the compound of our own bodies. Lack of leadership is what causes worry, fear, procrastination, mistakes, which lead in turn to further confusion. Whereas proper thinking, directed properly, at the proper time, removes most of the causes of the troubles from which we must later suffer so miserably. So our concentration 
has as its primary purpose merely to get hold of the reins of these faculties so that we can lead them and direct them for their good as well as ours but most of all for the good of nature and the great job and the great work that needs to be done now how are we going to particularly practice this concentration I've told you before many times I think of the delightful this incident that was told to me by someone who had started a few concentration exercises they said you know it's I just never been able to understand it the moment I keep quiet for a minute and get just nicely started in my concentration I itch somewhere <laughs> well this is just about the way it happens the moment the individual attempts to control himself in anything he either itches or hurts there seems to be nothing that you can uh, do to escape this procedure and you'd be surprised at the successful people who have wonderful reputations for accomplishment who are utterly bewildered at the thought of actually holding the mind under their control for one minute it's just not even possible well, with the mind so completely out of control, how can we expect our lives to be in any better condition? If we are the complete victims of whatever mood passes through our mental-emotional complex, how can we ever have world peace or individual peace? Plato, the great teachers, the great religious leaders, have all pointed out the need of the individual to achieve a certain integration a control of his own life now concentration uh, is a discipline that has to be adapted very largely again to the temperament of an individual uh, there are individuals who have used very strenuous procedures there are Indian sects for example that will plan, assign themselves some peculiar duty requiring concentration and every time through thoughtlessness they fail to perform that particular duty they simply take a knife and make a three inch slash in their arm and by the time they've made four or five hundred slashes they become quite thoughtful now this is a very extreme method and we hardly advise it in the West but the point is that these people so greatly value the concept of finally gaining control of their own thinking that they're willing to go to terrific ends to achieve this they have realized what we have never learned namely that this control is the basis of all forms of happiness that we seek that without self-control we can never be secure in anything for the average person however simpler and gentler methods generally will work with patience well, we had the, in the years gone by we've had the meditators and the concentrators uh, in huge numbers and uh, I noted that it also became a kind of escape for people who were a little lazy this concentration became the means of the great do-nothing in fact some reported to me that it was wonderful because they always went to sleep after the first two minutes it became a kind of discipline in private indolence and that was not the purpose intended also concentration with a little imagination tossed in to season it could lift the individual out of the commonplace into an imaginary world and make a high-grade introvert out of him in a short time he wouldn't even want to come back to this common world anymore he would much rather keep on meditating until the judgment day this didn't work actually uh, the answer is that in controlling yourself you must also control yourself and uh, in uh, deciding to concentrate you must also concentrate on not concentrating all the time I found in working with people that the that each individual had a kind of starting ground 
As Buddha points out, the long journey begins with the first step, and this is true in concentration. Most individuals will find concentration particularly helpful if either it is united with whatever religious devotion the person naturally is inclined to perform, as evening prayer or something of that nature, or that moment or two of, of dedication with which uh, the average person in Western civilization has already been rather well indoctrinated. Therefore, there are only certain things we would add to that. As we point out in this book, concentration ha has to have a certain element of work, a certain element of self-denial involved in it, because if it is only just always doing what you want to do, it is not discipline at that point. You have to be much wiser before you always want to do what is right. Therefore, there should be a certain amount of discipline. I recommend it, therefore, that the person who wished to concentrate would set aside or select, before he starts, a certain time, a time probably least likely to be interrupted, because he is fighting himself all the way, and there is no use making the labor impossible. But if he decides that at a certain hour in late evening, or in the early morning, he is least likely to be disturbed. He must then set a time for his concentrational procedure. And I have always advised that the time not exceed five minutes. This is hard on some of my friends who think they only get a good start up to the first hour. But you cannot live that way without neglecting something. This kills the purpose of it. Such an extensive type of concentration tells us that this person is running away from life, and that isn't the purpose of it at all. And also, it would be a very difficult for the beginner to actually concentrate that length of time. Almost impossible. There's bound to be a lot of wool gathering along the way. But in two or three minutes, concentration can be possible. The person choosing a place, uh, his foundation, where he establishes himself, a fairly comfortable chair or a pleasant place where he is not likely to sit and go to sleep. And then beginning the process of determining one-pointedness. Now in the beginning, one-pointedness is very difficult, especially uh, with, uh, with abstract thinking. And I do not advocate what some have, namely the, uh, the setting of this point of concentration upon some chakra or invisible structure within the individual himself. I've seen this get into a serious lot of trouble. I know one individual or group of individuals who were trying to concentrate upon the pineal gland in the brain. Of course, they did not know how. If they'd known a little more, they would have gotten a thorough short circuit. They didn't get that, but they did get a number of headaches which were quite unnecessary. It's not good to fool with that type of thing at that stage. It is far better to select some concentrational device to begin with, uh, by means of which there is some help in focusing attention. This is the purpose of the Eastern Mandala, the religious painting which represents some phase of universal procedure. This is also one of the utilities behind the great religious symbols of the world, the symbols of the faiths of men, which is, as instruments of uh, concentration uh, become uh, instruments of recollection. They enable the individual to draw upon certain resources within his ni own nature for thoughts, uh, for uh, visualizations, relating to these symbols, and also, which is very important, they keep him from thinking about himself, which is not his purpose at that particular moment. If he thinks about himself or wanders off into abstract concentration, he is very likely to see something that isn't there. So it is better to choose some natural device or symbol. Now, the nature of this is not important. It is the penetration associated with it that is important. Some people like to uh, select living things, uh, flowers or plants, and uh, I've often felt that a very fine uh, concentration device uh, for Western man 
would be the miniature living tree, the bonsai tree of the Japanese. But it could be a little plant that you have yourself cultivated in your garden, which would make it all the better as a concentration symbol. Or if you do not have such facilities, then to secure a small potted plant and have it live with you. But this is not necessary, but this is one way. Uh, a simple little device, an image, a design, a work of art, even a beautiful picture in a book, can be the type of thing which simply forms a catalyzing agent. It gives you a little something to draw your attention with. You will find also that even with this symbolic help, it is not easy to hold the attention very long. Now the question arises also, how much should we whip this attention to force it to remain upon the object of concentration? I would say in all uh, common sense that the beginner will probably have to use a small amount of effort. If he merely gives up the moment the mind wanders, he'll give up almost as quickly as he begins. He can't help it. Therefore, I would say that for a beginner starting out, if the mind wanders away from the symbol, that he may draw it back, not too forcibly, but with sufficient intensity to make it re-focus re, uh, upon the mood or the symbol or the idea involved. However, if the symbol or if the mind drifts away from the symbol three times in the course of a few minutes, I would say that after the third time it is not effective to try and draw it back. Then the person should simply uh, pass over that and go on and the next day try again. The purpose of the device of concentration is the regularity which can become inconvenient. The more you try to become regular in this, the more often interruptions will intrude themselves. So you have to gradually exercise a certain amount of discipline. In the book, I have suggested that the individual should uh, accomplish his concentration time with not more interruption than once a week. Uh, he may, to begin with, allow himself this interruption of once a week. But the rest of the time, in that he must have six days in succession, or six days out of every seven without interruption. This may mean he has to cancel a social engagement or miss something on television or some other horrible calamity <laughs> but he must be prepared to sacrifice something after all all he is hoping to gain is his immortal soul and he must sacrifice a little something for it occasionally if the, the concentration discipline is gradually developed then comes the problem of how we are to look at these symbols or this object how are we to understand it? We certainly do not wish merely to gaze at it until we're cross-eyed. That is not a virtue. Uh, in spite of the reports of some teachers in that direction. The purpose of concentration is not to develop a glassy glare at the object. The purpose of concentration is to become increasingly aware of the penetration of this object with consciousness. If, for example, we have chosen a, a living thing, a tree or a flower or a little plant or something of that nature, the purpose of our concentration is to achieve a rapport with it, to become aware of it as a consciousness, uh, to attempt to understand it and the processes of life which are involved in it to understand its livingness, to understand, as in the case of the plant, its growth, the unfoldment of life through it, and to gradually visualize within ourselves this growing thing as a symbol of the growth of all things. The mandala is always the symbol of a universal, until gradually we come through this concentration to the simple dynamic inner experience of the truth of growth itself. Another symbol might give us the dynamic of the truth of beauty, or the truth of order, or the truth of mathematical progression. Whatever the subject may be, the purpose is that the symbol 
shall unfold itself into a manifestation of universal law that out of this concentration we shall become aware more intimately and more directly of the great sources of instruction, of knowledge, of life, and of reality around us in nature. Finally, all of the mandalas, Tibetan, Chinese, Hindu, they even European where we occasionally find them, are representations of the universe. They are symbols of the infinite processes of existence. And our purpose of using in using them is to become aware of this livingness that the symbol portrays. The uh, final end of the concentration is therefore a kind of prolonged, gently sustained attentiveness in which gradually we make ourselves capable of receiving a connected report about life. That this report uh, is not broken up by our loss of attention. For the inflow of universal wisdom is never slowed or broken by anything except man's inability to receive it. Therefore, it is the breaking of the instrument of reception that cuts us off from the cosmic consciousness of things constantly. And the fragmentary nature of this instrument prevents us from tuning in at all without a certain amount of discipline. So discipline enables us to tune in. It enables us to turn our attention at will or according to need and to become uh, receptively expectant of the inflow of the truth of matters as this truth uh, is available to us at all times. Lao Tzu, the Chinese mystic, knew this. Sitting as a boy on the side of a mountain without a book, he found that all learning was available to him if he could receive. And that this reception meant the complete integration of his faculties. Not that they became wise in themselves or learned in themselves or that his mind became skillful in all matters and in all answers. The mind was simply the understander, the acceptor, that by means of which the incomprehensible truths of life were made comprehensible. The, serf, servant of the, of the, ser, the real use of the mind is not that it shall uh, express man's desires, but that it shall reveal to man the divine desires, the things as they are. Consequently, the mind is not really so much the servant of man as it is the servant of the infinite in man, becoming the instrument for the communication of the universal to the personal. Concentration is the setting up of the bridge. This concentrative process is a kind of antikaranas. It is the bridge which unites uh, the truth which we inwardly associate with the symbol and our own gradually unfolding receptivity to ideas. Thus I feel that uh, the concentration discipline has as its primary purpose merely to place man in rapport with the thing as it is. If he is making an engine or a machine or if he's driving a car, concentration of one kind makes him alert and careful and thoughtful in the driving of the car. Another kind of concentration, however, may make it possible for him to discover the law in the car. That every principle of the combustion engine is a symbol of a universal truth and that this combustion engine is therefore also a mandala which through contemplation and through simple concentrated focusing of energy may unfold to man certain of the greatest mysteries about his own nature and his own composition. Thus it is this process in concentration that the individual through gathering his faculties is able to experience universal truth in the most commonplace things penetrating all appearances and forms of things. 
seeing always substance and essence when he so desires. He does not do this at every moment and make himself a bore to everybody. But he does have the capacity at will to say what does this mean and discover what it means. So he gains two ends. He gains the, the great and beautiful end of being able to say that he is free because the individual is never free while he is the servant of his own opinions. He is free when he can think when he pleases, as he pleases. And he is doubly free when he pleases to think that which is so. He gains a definite further important contribution because through this exercise he forms a bridge so that he is constantly able at will to become aware of importances. Now, I've, I know uh, several instances of this kind of importances. Years ago, I knew a little Zen monk who at one time was very, very anxious for no reason that I've ever been able to discover to see an American baseball game. Now, there was nothing much less Zen-like in appearance than the baseball game. But I finally took this little man and took him to a ball game. And we couldn't have picked a worse one. It was one of those games which uh, practically causes the trained spectator to pick up the seats and throw them. After it was all over, I didn't know just how my little Zen friend was going to take on this. He was radiant. He said that game was the most beautiful example of Zen he had ever seen. To him, everything meant something. Of course, it meant nothing in terms of baseball. <laughs> but to him, it was all law. The way the man threw the ball, the way the man batted it, the way somebody else caught it or didn't catch it was terrific. He saw a universe unfolding on the gridiron. Well, it probably is there if you, if you want to study it. Because even the simplest game is based upon laws or the game won't work. You can't say that a game of bridge is not a highly skillfully developed formula. Unknown to those who play it and unappreciated to the individual who doesn't play it. But we cannot say that it has no message or no meaning. Uh, it depends upon what we can do to vitalize that meaning. And under concentration, the universe opens up into an infinite area of valid meaning. And all the doubts and fears and miseries and worries we've had about the universe dissolve. And in their places are these magnificent areas of experienced certainties. Thus concentration, I think, is a very valid discipline if it isn't overworked. And in the long run, the individual doesn't have to practice it at all. It becomes autom automatic. All disciplines, all rituals, all ceremonies are in a strange way themselves symbols of common experience. The individual prays for a few minutes each day until he suddenly re really realizes that the ultimate prayer is his own life, recited at all times. Some people can only feel godly for five minutes, so they have to pray. Others can feel godly all their lives, and their life is a prayer. And the words they speak would mean very little in comparison to the nobility of the deeds that they perform. Concentration is the same thing. The individual concentrates by discipline because he doesn't know how. Once he has learned how, it becomes an automatic process to be aware. And to use faculties for awareness rather than for criticism and condemnation. And as soon as the individual gains this awareness, he gains with it not a closed out universe in which all unimportant things are left behind, but a universe in which there are no longer unimportant things. But everywhere experiences.
which if understood become beautiful, become meaning, and add to the wealth of our understanding, appreciation, love, and regard. In this type of meaning, I think concentration becomes highly valid. But concentration to get what you want, in the common sense of the word, I do not regard as valid. Unless what you want is simply the power to appreciate the beautiful. If we do not ask for things, but ask only as the old monk did, for the power, the insight to see the good that is, then gradually the concentrated faculty develops, changes our lives, and makes us gracious, wonderful, and acceptable people. Thus the discipline actually becomes a, a sacramental way of life. Never difficult, never heavy, never boring, never unctuous, never sanctimonious, but simply the quiet ability to get much more beauty, glory, fun, and happiness out of simple things than we've ever known before. This is the childlikeness of Mencius. This is the natural faculty of man, which until contaminated, sees good, God, and truth in everything. This concentration, if quietly developed, I believe would be beneficial. Now I think we better give you all a chance to try it. So we'll be seeing you a week from tonight. <laughs>